the golden verses of the Pythagoreans is the title given to a comparatively brief poem. The original authorship being unknown. Traditionally, it is believed that these verses were written by Pythagoras himself. There is much to indicate the possibility, but the actual facts are not available. We know, however, that at a comparatively early period, these verses were regarded as a true exposition of his teaching, and the internal content binds them very closely to the school of Pythagoras. As we realize, very little has come down to us in the actual words of this great Greek philosopher. He is recognized and revered principally for the mysterious impact which he bestowed upon the entire field of classical learning. Nearly all who came after him in Western culture have admitted indebtedness to a system. Yet this system has survived mostly through interpretation and commentary by other persons. Pythagoras flourished in the 6th century before the Christian era. His school at Crotona was ultimately destroyed by vandalism, and it is believed that the master himself was martyred. At the time of the destruction of the academy, or institute, the buildings were burned, and it is assumed that this is the cause of the loss of such manuscripts or documents as might have survived about him. We also know that he was little given to placing his teachings in written form. He taught mostly in person and by conduct, and therefore only those who received advancement within his school were permitted to have direct contact with him and to receive orally the instruction which he bestowed. Some fragments in writing, either his own or notes by his disciples, did survive. These have more or less disappeared in the course of time, unless we are to assume that the best of them have been gathered into the golden verses. One of the outstanding interpreters and commentators upon these verses was Heracles, and we are indebted to him for the form and beauty with which the verses have descended to our time. Nor should the student expect to find within this brief structure any elaborate dissertation upon Pythagoreanism. As again might be suspected from the nature of the man, the verses are very largely a summary of the practical aspect of philosophy. In these verses, a way of conduct is exemplified, and the truth seeker is brought into gentle but strong association with the Pythagorean mood about learning. It was evidently the teaching of this great philosopher that all philosophy was for two purposes, and that by various applications these purposes led to ultimate enlightenment. The first end of philosophy was the life of virtue, and the second end of philosophy was the restoration of the state of the soul in its relation to truth. This was conceived to be a twofold path because in the first part, man, by a series of decisions made in his own nature and of his own free will, qualified himself for learning. The second and following part assumed this qualification had been attained, and that from that point on, the mind and the reason, liberated from ignorance and error, could proceed directly 
toward the contemplation of reality. The verses are a sort of orphic hymn, much in the classical mode of the time, and begin with the importance of man establishing the practice or habit of venerating naturally and simply that which required or invited a veneration. Therefore, the verse is open with the simple reminder that it is the duty of all good persons to venerate the good, uh, to hold in highest esteem those divine powers which are the fountains of good. Thus man is encouraged to acknowledge and to learn to adore and understand the spiritual roots and beginnings of our life. And in the Greek manner it would be natural that the verses should therefore open with a kind of hymn inviting the truth seeker to pay homage to the gods, the heroes, to just persons, and those who by various achievements and attainments have become worthy of our deepest and most continuing regard. It was the natural practice of the Greeks to invite the individual to grow through a kind of discrimination. And this is represented in the opening sections of the verses. The individual who can perceive the good, though he may not yet practice it, who has this discrimination within to, in himself to honor first that which is most honorable, to venerate first that which is most venerable, will through these procedures come to recognize the importance and dignity of good things. If we give our lives cheerfully and our hearts and minds gladly uh, to those things which are best, if within ourselves we gradually develop a code in which we honor, respect, and revere those qualities which are most eternal, most worthy of our general and continuing admiration, then we are constantly presenting ourselves with good ideas. We are constantly reminding ourselves of the importance of the life of virtue as the pathway leading to the attainment of truth. Now many persons today in our way of life do not feel very much respect or reverence or veneration for anything. And we sort of feel today that to bestow such a mood is to fall under a kind of antique pattern. Yet Pythagoras was probably wiser than most moderns. Not in the fact that we should go about worshipping each other, such was not the intent of the verses, but rather that we should have discrimination enough to choose to bestow our largest admiration upon that which deserves it. For only by so thinking and feeling, only by giving of ourselves to that which is a just and legitimate uh, requirement, can we maintain our own orientation in this world? One of our troubles in the modern world is that we venerate the wrong things. And because man is a venerating creature, he must have his heroes. We all must respect something. And Pythagoras points out that when we respect that which is superior, we ine inevitably incline ourselves to become like that superior. Where our heroes are, there our allegiances are also. And that which we really believe to be better, we inevitably and instinctively emulate. If therefore we emulate the wrong things, if we choose our heroes from the wrong levels of attainment, then instinctively and clearly we are indicating weaknesses 
in our own natures. Everywhere, in everything, man should reserve his respect for that which challenges him to greater attainment. The, cl the uh, craftsman instinctively respects a superior artisan, one whose knowledge is greater than his own. Uh, the average musician respects the greater musical genius. Uh, the average physician respects the great physician. All of us are inclined to respect achievement in fields that we understand. And this instinct should lead us ultimately to recognize the need to, de to venerate those great principles in the universe, which are the fullness of all qualities, which today we recognize and practice only in part. If, therefore, in any generation, we examine those persons or things most admired and respected, we come into a valuable psychological key to the qualities of that generation, to its instinctive interests and indifferences. If we then are to progress along the way of philosophic enlightenment, we must begin uh, to respect those qualities, those beings, those principles in nature uh, toward which we are striving and which we must visualize at least within ourselves if we are to have the courage and industry to proceed to the attainment. This then becomes a continual, gentle remembrance of great and good things, and our willingness to choose between good, better, and best, always seeking to discover the best, and by so doing to challenge ourselves to be like the best. I think this more or less uh, summarizes the opening thought of the verses. From this opening thought, we then move naturally to the beginnings of philosophy. And these beginnings have to do with the refinement of conduct. All growth begins with a kind of dedication. The individual cannot proceed unless he regards the end to justify the effort. Unless he has purpose, he will never move directly toward it. Unless he has an archetypal conviction, he will not live according to that conviction. Thus we come upon what might be termed the theological overtone of the verses. Namely, the man gradually experiencing within himself, through learning, through observation, through association, gradually experiencing the fact that there is a better way of life than that which we commonly live. And that this better way of life has rewards and opens doors and brings consolations that the lesser way of life cannot experience. Thus the verses invite the individual to recognize that a superior way of life is man's protection against those conditions which arise from an inferior way of life. That growth is continuous, and that therefore man is constantly seeking uh, nobler and fuller expressions for his own internal resources. Thus the beginning of man's life of discipline is not effective unless this discipline is purposed. The individual cannot discipline himself, nor will he find the incentives or the moral support of his own energies, unless this discipline is purposeful, unless it becomes the most important thing in all the world. The individual will not have the energy and the continuity and the dedication to carry it on toward the attainment of self-improvement. Pythagoras obviously knew in his time, we find records historically bearing upon these matters, that the average person, though he be uncomfortable, miserable, variously dilemmaed, does not in all these negative circumstances have sufficient energy or sufficient inducement 
to correct his own way of life. He is rather hope against miracles, phenomena of some kind which will save him in spite of himself. He seeks to surround himself with comforts to substitute for the absence of securities. He is forever compromising because his incentives and his inducements are not great enough. Now the Pythagoreans were well, well aware that man's inducements must clarify with his growth. The individual in a state of ignorance cannot be certain of those great good things which are the ends of wisdom. Yet discipline comes to him from another source, whether he be certain or not. And this source lies in the religious conviction of his peoples. In those days, of course, what we would term today the agnostic or the atheist were rare. There were not great numbers of persons who were unbelievers, who did not have some faith or substance of belief in themselves. Therefore, the beginning of this discipline was to a degree simple religious virtue. The individual standing in the presence of the Decalogue delivered by Moses, or listening gently and quietly to a reading of the Beatitudes, was moved not by reason, but by faith, by the recognition that these words, these commandments, these great institutes were wise, were benevolent, and were con so considered as to make life best for him. So the beginning of the life of virtue is the acceptance of the divine way, as brought by revelation, by teachers, by venerated prophets, and by the great uh, spiritual leaders of the race. Under these conditions, the individual may turn to piety simply because it is the good way, not because he understands why, but because he knows in his daily conduct that persons who live this way are better friends, better relations, more honorable associates in all the walks of life. He learns in his daily living that we finally depend for our safety in this world upon the honor of others and that this honor is important to us, and that our honor is important to them. Thus the honorable life must precede the life of discipline. It must be a way in which, for reasons commonly obvious, we do those things commonly approved as good, maintaining constantly with it the simple faith that the performance of these good things is not only acceptable to our fellow men, but is in harmony with the great religious and spiritual universe in which we exist. So in the beginning all things may not be clear, but that good is desirable is universally accepted, and that which is desirable shall be practiced on all occasion and with all fortitude, and the individual shall in the service of good strengthen such resources as he may possess. So the Pythagorean golden verses begin to emphasize the gradual establishment of value. They begin to point out how man attains to his natural human estate, and that this estate begins in the cultivation of adequate self-control in all things that there can be no victory for the individual who is unable to direct his own life. That this direction of life becomes more clear as we proceed, but that at any stage the individual must still be the leader of the total of himself. So we have another ancient uh, classical axiom, namely that man as a being, as a center of life and light, must lead his total personality and never be the victim of it. Thus the best part of man must govern man, even as the best part of men must govern the rest. And as God being the best part of the universe leads all of it, so in every creature there is a God, there is a supreme being or power or principle, that which is superior to the rest, and this must always guide the rest. 
If the individual is not led by the best of himself, he falls not only into evil, but falls away from religion. For the best part in all things is that part most like God. And not to be led by that is to fall into error. Thus the God in things must be the protector, the guardian, the teacher, the guide, and the master of all the parts of its own nature. So man seeking for understanding, seeking for discipline, seeking ways to put his life in order that he may be acceptable to the Most High, must first of all choose or select the best of himself and make this leader of the rest. Now in the Pythagorean system, uh, being a philosophical school, it was assumed that in man, that which we call reason is the best part. Now reason is not just mind, nor is it just emotion, nor is it just higher thinking. Reason is that thing or power or faculty in man which determines the reasonable which determines those things possible, likely, those things next in sequence. Reason not only lifts man from a lesser state, but it prevents him from tumbling headlong into an unknown state. Reason not only hastens him from his ignorance, but reason also slows his step when he comes to things more difficult than he can immediately manage. Thus reason becomes a constant impulse toward the reasonable. And the reasonable in turn is the essence or principle behind the practical. Therefore all things truly practical are reasonable. And all things truly reasonable are practical. And that which is practical is that which makes possible in each instance the greater good. Thus all practical purposes are those purposes best calculated to most directly attain a desirable and necessary end. That reason should lead, therefore, means that the individual should be led by his own discriminating power. And discrimination is not only a, a, a stimulant, a principle of aspiration in man, it is a moderator. It is a guardian against all excess. And Pythagoras was one of the first to point out that aspiration not controlled by moderation can itself be an excess. And that there are many virtues which if over practiced become vices. And nearly all virtues separated from the total pattern of the way of virtue, isolated and broken off from the parent stem will themselves lead to confusion and discord. So the reasonable must in all other things be the governor, most suitable to be venerated, most worthy of our admiration. And by the reasonable, the Pythagoreans pointed out that in man, these reasonable powers are like the divine powers of the universe. They are not only the guides, but of themselves and in themselves. They are the sources of the reasonable world, a world of things essentially good, until through ignorance and through man's own lack of discipline, they are brought into inharmonious proportions and relations. Thus man is to be guided and led by the reasonable, by the cultivation of his own faculties and powers so that he may become a reasoning being. Now reasoning also points out that in life nothing must be done without a reason. And nothing for which there is a reason may be left undone. So the Pythagoreans were very strict on this point. But the moment it becomes obvious that we have a need, that need must be met. And it must be met in a manner that is in accordance with the laws governing right action. And in everything, a problem always implies that man has not yet focused his own reason and his resource upon some circumstance of life. 
Man can never be problemed by that which is less than himself. But he is always in the present presence of problem when he deals with that which is in excess of himself. Therefore he must grow. And solution is always the enlargement of himself so that he becomes greater than the problem that confronts him. Now the reasonable, if it is once enthroned as the governor of life, and its responsibilities and its proprieties are delineated. The reasonable then begins to demand of man that he unite all other resources in its service, that all things must lead to the a fulfillment of reasonable ends and purposes, and that man's composite nature must serve his enlightenment, contribute to it, and assist him to grow more rapidly. The Pythagoreans then uh, begin their natural disciplines, the disciplines of reason, by telling the individual to look into himself. And to look into himself, they established a discipline uh, which is strongly emphasized in the Golden Verses. And this is the discipline which we might call retrospection. That every person at the end of his day must sit down and turn his own life into a text for his own enlightenment. Most of us are so busy contemplating the works of others, disagreeing with the opinions of others, and dissatisfied with the conduct of others, that they totally ignore self-analysis. Yet self-analysis is more vital to man than the analysis of anything else. For by self-analysis, man begins to prepare the disciplining of his own conduct. Thus to the Pythagoreans, philosophy is not an intellectual pursuit. It is a way of life. It is life under the discipline of the reasonable. And any abstraction that cannot be immediately associated with immediate conduct must be held in suspension until the proper time. The mind shall never go into vagary. It shall never substitute intellectual activity for discipline. It shall never retire into a contemplative existence by which it is permitted to ignore conduct. The individual is not to sit in a mountain somewhere looking down indifferently upon his own conduct. He must grow through his conduct and must use his own personal experience as the great text which will lead him toward the life of discrimination. If he becomes sincere in this, if he is honest, he will then be able to look back, not only upon the preceding day, but perhaps upon preceding years, and begin to benefit by the things that he has, has along the way rejected. Man is forever rejecting truth. The moment this truth appears uncomfortable, the moment it differs from his own personal pleasure, will, design, or opinion, he promptly forgets it or ignores it. But out of his retrospection, he may restore it again as a guide and lead to conduct. In going back through the day, the verses tell us that it is the duty of each individual to perceive through contemplation uh, those procedures which he has practiced and the results which they have attained. He should search for those things which he has done well and observe the useful consequences. He should perceive those things which he has not done well and notice how they brought misery or misfortune upon himself and others. He must search out also the good things which he has not done, which had he performed them, would have gained uh, advantage to his world or to himself. Also the things which were bad which he has performed, and should gradually use his own life as a textbook. He may always say to himself in the Pythagorean mood, if I am not happy, if I am not adjusted, if I am not constructively dedicated, then there is something wrong with me. 
Now, Pythagoras makes this tremendous point that it is utterly worthless for an individual to be miserable and at the same time say that he is right. He cannot. He may be right in a sense, but that sense is not great enough. He may have been true to the wrong things. His insight may not have been great enough to lift him above the level of problem. But the individual who cannot solve his problem in some reasonable way is not, as yet, capable of regarding himself as above error. He is imperfect or his works are perfect. And that which is essentially true will never result in that which is essentially untrue. Always then, the individual's discrimination must be strengthened through the observation and reflection upon the consequences of immediate conduct. Man may also gain from this a certain reference frame. And having considered these matters in relation to his own nature, he may re reconsider them in the nature of tradition and of example and of experiences with others around him or out of the memory of his religions, philosophies, arts, and sciences. He will then observe that though they may be persecuted in their own time and regarded as offenders in their day, those whom the world best loves and most remembers are those who were true to the great discipline of ethics. That those who have practiced certain virtues have gained a certain everlastingness as a reward. So the person, thinking in terms of self-improvement, can see not only a personal advantage but a universal advantage. He can perceive the justification and he can also perceive that the attainment is possible for others have attained it, and by attaining have become the universal benefactors of mankind. The verses then stress this important practical self-analysis, that the person should use his own life as a constant and immediate text, and by so doing, and using every available amount of reason that he possesses, he must begin to invoke uh, the central part of life. For example, if an individual is utterly confused and there is no center of integration within him, then obviously the divine part of his own nature is submerged. For deity cannot be confused. Truth and reason cannot be confused. And if man looking upon a stormy sea within his own psychic life, sees within himself no strength, no hope, no verisimilitude, then that individual has failed, or is failing, to call upon those resources most available to him. He must then gradually restore the dignity of superiors within his own nature. He must do so because he must have leadership. The failure of central leadership means confusion and chaos, and no individual can do well in a chaos. Thus he must elevate some principle within himself, and this principle, by whatever name he calls it, is still the personification of the divine attribute. Some individuals in this emergency seek to uh, draw into integration the concept of God hoping in this to find an inward strength against outward stress. <clears throat> Others may seek to build character or conduct. They may say, at least I will be honest, or I shall try to see good in all things, or I shall place love above hate, or I shall place wisdom above ignorance, or I shall regard the need for the improvement and integration of my own resources. I will put learning above lack of learning. I will put knowledge above lack of knowledge. I will put order above chaos. Whatever we do, whatever decision we make, we must elect from our parts a leader, and that leader must guide us. And that leader must be some phase, value, or quality of good, something strong enough to inspire us to go on. 
The moment we establish this leadership, many of our troubles cease. Most of our uh, chaos and confusion is overcome. The golden verses state it rather uh, modestly. They say that the individual who has this true internal leadership suffers from a minimum of ills. Whereas others have many disasters, this leadership gradually reduces disaster. We may not immediately dispel all of it, but that part which we cannot dispel, we are now enabled to meet and carry with natural dignity. So for man in his various intermediate stages between ignorance and wisdom, we depend upon the leadership of the best in ourselves, and we depend upon reason bestowing patience, bestowing understanding, and making all things a little more useful, so that we are often able to recognize the wisdom and goodness in those circumstances which previously disturbed us. Little by little, through these disciplines, then, we begin the integration of a useful and constructive life. Now, the Pythagoreans imposed the discipline of reason upon the immediacy of conduct in this way. They said that man naturally is responsive to impulse, and that in a moment of emergency, the impulse comes first and the reason comes later. Therefore, it is up to man to remove emergency as far as conceivably possible from his entire pattern of life. Emergency is not as stupendous, tremendous, or inevitable as we think. That which most frequently and easily corrects or prevents emergency is moderation. Nearly all emergency arises from an immoderate situation. Emergency, for instance, arises when we have delayed too long in the use of judgment. Emergency arises when we come into the presence of the unexpected, when in sober truth we should have expected long before. Emergency comes with the impact of a sudden incident, yet there are very few sudden incidents in life. Thus, emergencies may be reduced. There are some which we probably cannot immediately cope with. But the daily emergencies which lead us to the common mistakes, which in turn gather to cause an unhappy life, these emergencies are most of them to be easily prevented, easily met, if the individual will use discrimination and will be led uh, by the principle of wisdom within himself. Thus, our life to escape emergency must be, says the verses, the life of moderation. Moderation, for instance, in itself, cuts away from us much discord. Moderation in all things uh, will not only assist us to rule our affairs more adequately, but will liberate much of our time from the burden of critical situations. Moderation also prevents those excesses of temperament by which we push matters too rapidly, or also will prevent us from permitting emotion to dominate conduct in a critical situation. Moderation is the reduction of excess. It is the reduction of ambition to reasonable bounds. Itself, something that will protect health, happiness, and help to strengthen the relations of life. I was talking to a family not long ago in which the family is bankrupt simply because the man of the family is inordinately ambitious. He is so ambitious to attain certain things that he is neglecting life itself for these things. And in all probability, if he continues his present course, he is heading into a nervous breakdown, or he is heading into a heart difficulty. And this ambitious man, who has had no time to live as a father, a husband, and a friend, will probably drop dead in his fifties. 
without ever having achieved the natural good things which life would bestow. Naturally, his attitudes are warped by the lack of social adjustments, and he is a poor person because his ambitions have never been moderated by other values. Always, moderation releases energy from things inferior and dedicates it to the attainment of things superior. Moderation in living reduces the jealousies and envies of our associates. When we try to live beyond our means, we make enemies. Uh, we also destroy the trust that people have. And when we become hopelessly in debt, we destroy our own security. By doing all things moderately and reasonably, living in the natural dignity of our kind, and placing the attainment of value above the attainment of things, yet at the same time neglecting no duty or obligation. Thus we become moderate creatures, and through moderation relieve ourselves of a great variety of emergencies. The individual who has all lost his furniture, his automobile, and his house, because he could not keep up his payments, is a person confronted with an emergency, and we may be sorry for him. But he will continue to have emergency because it is in himself and not in the financing corporation. He has simply failed to be moderate. He has failed to be thoughtful. He has failed to let reason guide his conduct. Therefore, he is in trouble. And as Pythagoras even then pointed out, such men in such emergency curse the gods failing utterly to see that it's their own mistake. By moderation also, we reduce pressures, and pressures release thought. And where pressures come down to a moderate level, the individual has greater mental leisure. He has greater opportunity to plan. The more emergency-filled his life is, the, least, the less energy he has for planning and purpose. And ultimately, he becomes totally absorbed in his desperate effort to adjust to the moment. He lives for the moment and dies in one of those moments. Thus, uh, the disciplines of Pythagoras begin with a very practical situation. Namely, this placing of a good shepherd, a leader of souls, inside of each person. This shepherd that is kindly to the wayward sheep, and even kindly to the black sheep, the one faculty in us which does not like to get better. And we continue to wander, but the good shepherd and his kindly dog, which is philosophy, philosophy is the dog of wisdom helps to bring back the sheep again and keeps them in the sheepfold which is the right way and the right place and is security. Consequently, in all these things, man must become his own good shepherd, watching the flock of his emotions and desires and make his, making certain that the stray sheep does not fall victim to the wolf of avarice. If he is careful, thoughtful and loving in these pursuits, he is already tempering himself, beginning to have the possibility of internal experience. For actually, when we put our outer life in order, we free our inner life. We give it an opportunity to do those things and be that thing which is right. Now, as we begin to overcome these weaknesses, we clarify the values in terms of internal. We discover that the ways of the internal are more beneficial, more pleasant, more useful than the ways of the external. We realize that every part of ourselves, and in the, the golden verses some emphasis is placed upon the body, that it is proper that man should regard the body as the instrument of his purpose, that he should be kind to it, guard it, take care of it, and preserve it by his own reason from any excess that will injure it. But if his own reason and his own emotions themselves are addicted to excess, 
Then he works a terrible hardship on his body, bringing it down to ruin and bringing with it the ruin of his inner life. But the importance that man's leadership shall be complete, but always benevolent. He must then, according to the golden verses, realize always that to the degree he grows, he becomes a paternal or maternal being. Growth is always in the direction of parenthood. Growth is never in the direction of autocracy. Now many persons Im imply that parenthood is an autocracy. And that is one of the tragedies that has burdened homes for thousands of years. The belief that the parent is by divine right the master and proprietor of his family. This is not true. The parent by divine right is the good shepherd of his family. Always. He is the one to whom that family has a right to turn for protection and for understanding. The obedience given to the parent is given not to a person but to the principles for which that parent may stand. And Socrates probably paid with his life for telling his disciple that a wise son should instruct his father and that the mere physical relationship of father to son does not permit the father who is ignorant to dominate the son who is wiser. But it is the natural desire of parenthood to lead, to lead constructively and benevolently. But parenthood is not limited to physical things, but it is an attitude, it is a concept. The moment an individual knows more, he is more patient. The person who knows more is best able to estimate the circumstances behind the weakness of others. And these circumstances, if understood, cannot lead to condemnation. We may advise, we may try to help, but it uh, speaks very clearly in the golden verses that the wiser person, the adjusted person, the discriminating person, is not presumed to lock himself in endless conflict with others, nor is he to judge them, nor is he to condemn them. He is to understand them. And this is the blessed privilege, for as much as the parent is indulgent with the small child, knowing that that child must pass through certain experiences. So the wise scholar is indulgent with those less informed than himself, realizing that they are children, or less mature than himself, and therefore in need of his love and affection and his intelligent guidance, not in need of heartlessness, criticism, condemnation, or rebuke alone. Thus, by wisdom, we gain patience, and by patience, all good things become possible. There is no substitute for it. By wisdom also, we gain charity, and charity is not merely the sharing of goods. It comes from the Greek charitas, which means love. It is the individual giving of his own understanding, giving of what he is, not merely of what he has. All these points are made in the golden verses simply because they are part of the process that frees discrimination from the tyranny of sense. Now most persons are much more interested in advanced studies. They want to go on to very involved doctrines. And here Pythagoras, perhaps of all the great teachers, uh, would not accompany them. He insisted that it was useless and valueless to attempt to develop special faculties of consciousness until the ordinary part of man was put in order. That we must build upon the firm foundation of achievement in small matters. That we must grow sequentially. And that we shall never discover anything 
that will cure our dispositional problem except our own effort. We can never intellectually advance far enough to get out of our human problem. The only way we can solve that problem is to meet it and correct it. The only way we can gain this liberation is through this retrospective process of studying ourselves. Now very often this kind of study has a drawback. And this drawback is more common to us because, as we have said, the modern world is rather different from antiquity in its attitude toward life. The Pythagorean disciplines belong to a way of life in which man had certain definite values which are more or less absent in our contemporary pattern. Pythagoras lived in a world of people who were essentially simple people. He lived in a world in which man's religion was a very simple and naturalistic ritual. In those days there was not much fear in religion, nor was there the pressure of confusion of sect and belief which we know today. The Greek and Italian states had their native religion. Most persons followed it. Some attempted to interpret it, but a common faith held all men together. Also, there was a great and definite tendency to admire the philosophic life. Religion and philosophy led the public mind. Those who attained in these fields were regarded as the outstanding citizens. Thus the drift or trend was toward these matters, whereas today the drift and trend is not toward these matters. And the individual does not have the common strength of a natural simple faith which was founded in the belief in good, and that things which were natural, fine, orderly, sequential, and kindly were good. Not having this common strength today, not having this simple foundation upon which to build, we have more confusion in our ways than perturb the ancient. At the same time, we have greater opportunity, for the greater the problem, the greater the victory. One of the primary virtues is not to be exploited, but it is to attain this end by reason, by judgment, by integrity. I believe there was a comedian here, W.C. Fields, some years ago, who pointed out that you cannot cheat an honest man. And it is very difficult. Because the honest man does not expect a bargain. And nearly all trouble begins when we try to get something for nothing. From that moment on, we are ready to be exploited because our own attitude is actually an open invitation to the dishonesty of others. And we will ultimately find someone who will take advantage of us. If, on the other hand, we expect nothing we do not earn, we have discrimination in matters of quality, we have foresight not to permit ourselves to become involved in situations we cannot control, and little by little we have ordered our own lives. We are going to be very, very hard to cheat. The individual forgetting himself bestows his total life upon others is likely to be a greater burden than a help. And the person knowing not what to do, helping others to do it, only compounds the confusion. The blind lead the blind, and all fall into the ditch together. Therefore, the first duty of a leader is to make sure that his own eyes are open. And in order to have them open, whether it be in the simple leadership of home and family, or in the greater leadership of nation or race, the leader must have internal resources greater than his followers, or he is not justified in leading them. And these resources must be good. They must be resources founded in virtue, guided by wisdom, moderated by reason and judgment, 
and given constant vitalization by the inspouses of virtue and truth. When these things are present, then good results, and the individual finds his growth and his natural way of life constantly enriching. This of Pythagoras pointed out again that the Pythagorean way of life was not for everyone at any given moment. He could not cause the individual to come into those emergencies of life by which decision is necessary. He could only point out that once the individual has determined to improve himself, it can be accomplished. If, therefore, the individual, coming in his own due time to that maturity of insight, which makes him realize that improvement is necessary to survival, only that individual is ready for the philosophic life. And having made this dedication, he can then proceed as far as his own integrity will sustain him. And he will go as far as his insight will sustain his determination to succeed. This was called the philosophic few, that group that had reached the point where it had suddenly realized that its trouble was due to itself. The world was then divided into two parts, the one the larger part being composed of persons who blame others. They are the unphilosophic material. Then there is the smaller group that recognizes self-responsibility for the consequences of conduct. This is the smaller group ready for greater insight. And those who had this insight could be led along that, the road of wisdom and could make that journey which leads finally back to our eternal home. The, reward, the rewards of discipline, then, are the gradual integrations of the factors of living, so that at last we can sit down quietly and say to ourselves with full meaningfulness that we live in a good world, that we are surrounded by people who are essentially good, whose conduct that has long offended us is the result of the same circumstances that impelled our conduct which so long offended them. That we are all moved by the same non-tranquillities, and that by patience and growth we have grown, and that by patience and growth they will grow. We are there to help them, but only to help them to help themselves, for no man can grow for another and no man can save another. But by example, we can invite others to the contemplative way of life. Having gradually reached this integration in ourselves, we come to the end of conflict. We are no longer bowed down by the opinions of others. We no longer cater to their weaknesses. We no longer subscribe to their superstitions. Rather, we live quietly, respecting all things, and serving mostly, and with all our contrition of spirit, that which is essentially true. Thus we come to what might be termed the fulfillment of the cathartic discipline of purification. We have removed impurity from ourselves. For all negative emotions, all uh, negative thoughts are impurities. All things which are not toward the good are away from the good. And that which is not for truth is against truth. And that which brings misery to ourselves and sorrow to others is not for the truth. Nor can we practice it with good grace, even though it be a dogma or doctrine of our time. We must be superior to these things, for we find that dogmas and doctrines are man-made formulations around ideas essentially superior to these doctrines. And beyond all doctrine is the simple example of the good life lived for the great teacher who was the source of the doctrine. 
Having thus concluded or consummated a reasonable attainment in the life of discrimination, the life of purification, the verses then tell us to direct our attention towards the sovereignties of those divine powers which are the rulers and leaders of the universe. From, the, from overcoming weakness, we then move to the growing of strength. From getting rid of that which is not so, we come to the cultivation of that which is so. In other words, we rise above the not-self, the illusion in man, the egoism, egocentricity and selfishness, which have so long disfigured the human personality. And being freed of these lesser despots, having escaped from the tyranny and anarchy of self-will, the individual is ready to contemplate the mystery of the divine will. And all allegiances must be moved from that which is essentially human to that which is essentially divine. Yet at the same time, we must know the divine through the human, but we must understand the human through the divine. They are conditions, degrees, and excellences of each other, and these we must contemplate with every means at our disposal. The, the being, the self in man, freed from slavery uh, or involvement in the hopeless confusion and complex of externalized existence naturally turns its face like the sunflower to the source of its own light. It naturally and instinctively rejoices in good and moves toward the experience of identity with good. Is, is this goes along in its reasonable and proper manner, the human being finds moving from within himself the tremendous flowing of the divine will. He recognizes that to the degree that he is receptive, the divine becomes an, an imminent thing, filling all of his parts and members, and causing him to become more and more like the source of good. And thus the individual, through the rise of his contemplative disciplines, moves into the true state of religion. And the true state of religion is companionship with God, comradeship with universals. The individual, having given up a false allegiance, must now make a true one. And in his true allegiance, he unites himself with that sovereign power which moves all things. He becomes aware more and more of divine consciousness because he has freed himself from the obscuration of mortal consciousness. He finds himself not only thinking about God but with God. Not only experiencing uh, the fact of the divine as a wonderful rationalized knowing but also emotionally reacting to it until finally it becomes the total being of himself. Thus the attainment of the better life leads toward this mystical experience, this illumination, uh, this final identification, which is the sovereignty of truth in the life of the person. Only after the disciplines, therefore, does man gain the power for the unconditioned veneration of the ultimate good. To venerate, we must to a degree understand. We cannot truly venerate that which is incomprehensible. Therefore, to recognize universal good, we must have some of goodness in ourselves. If we would recognize universal truth, we must have some of truthfulness in ourselves. Finding in the infinite the fulfillment and fullness of all virtues which we practice in part. But in time that which is in part shall pass away, and we shall know all things in fullness and in truth. So the Pythagorean verses go on to indicate the future state of these beings uh, which have uh, emancipated themselves. And of course, following the old Greek and also the Egyptian method, 
The philosophy ties into the mystery of death. Because death now becomes symbolical. Every time we forget the old, we die and are born into the new. The individual who gives up a grudge dies to be born a better person. For always death is the giving up of the old, and birth is the attainment of the new. Therefore every day that we grow, an old self dies, and a new self is born. Bondage lies in continuing in the same self, without freedom. If we never outgrow what we have been, we are bound to it forever. And this is inconceivable and impossible. Therefore, we are forever being reborn. And we are forever dying out of a lessness. And with every new experience, which is like the addition of a molecule or an electron to a formula, a totally new being comes into existence. Therefore, St. Paul says, I die daily. And out of this constant death of the old and the rebirth of the new, man is moving forward in consciousness. Every disillusionment, discouragement, despair, criticism and condemnation is another death. Every discovery of good is a new birth. Every hope that springs within us is a new birth in time. A birth of a new being dedicated to new purposes and new principles. There is an old self in each of us that must perish and a new self in each of us that must be liberated into manifestation. And this new self is a messianic self, a self which has within it the healing of all the old problems that burdened us. Every time we become bigger than a problem, we are reborn, because we have attained freedom. We are in slavery to ignorance, but we are free men in the light of truth and of wisdom and of understanding. So in the death situation, or symbolism, comes the idea that through the death of the old, through the death of the lower being, man is liberated into the higher regions of true being. And the Pythagorean verses go on to point out that man having attained the philosophic death and the philosophic rebirth, the old self having died by discipline, the new self having been born by inspiration and aspiration. But this new being now transforms itself from a creature of the earth to a creature of heaven. It is like this fable of Cupid and Psyche. It is like the butterfly symbol which the Greeks used for the soul. The mortal being a caterpillar crawling upon the earth, then entering discipline or into a state of internal integration by building the cocoon, and finally bursting forth as a winged creature, flying into the light. These are the states of man's soul, and it is the purpose of the golden verses to bring man to this radiant power of flight, to give him the wings of intuition and reason, that he may ascend out of the darkness of the underworld, straight to the light of truth. And these are not the wings of false learning fastened on by wax, which will melt off when we get too near the sun. These are our natural wings, hidden within ourselves, not put upon us from without. And these natural wings will sustain us, for we contain within our own nature this power of flight, this power of motion directly to the source of things. And it is so moved toward the source that man attains the end of the Pythagorean life. So the golden verses declare that at the end of man's search for reality, he shall himself truly become as the gods, knowing good and evil. He shall attain to communion with the eternal powers at the root of life. He shall join with them and serve with them. He shall be their instrument, and they shall live through him. And through his own growth, Man keeps the faith with the gods and releases them. For a god is born every time the god in man is born. And all good things coming into birth through man 
bear witness to the eternal will of the everlasting good. Man becoming a servant of good becomes one with the gods. And having attained this, according to the Pythagorean verses, he enters into a state of felicity. He then comes no longer into the sorrow and darkness of the unknown, but he goes forth serving good as gloriously and as fully as he has previously served ignorance. Now if we look upon man in his present state and see how he wanders on year after year, generation after generation, age after age, performing these same mistaken things which have mutilated and distorted history since the beginning, we find that man has an almost inconceivable capacity to continue, to do things as they have been done, to continue the processes which have become natural and familiar to him. If therefore this man becomes enlightened, if he truly becomes one with the divine power, he may then subsist continuously in this, finding a way of life as glorious, as happy, and as extensive as his more miserable existence is today. He will find then that all institutions which are necessary for his good will flourish, that his life and his world will be enriched, that peace will come to him, that the great enemies, sin and death, will disappear. If not literally, their power over him will vanish. For it is not death but the fear of death that slaves men to mortality. All things not good vanish away in the light of good. And it is perfectly possible and perfectly conceivable for men to live as well as they now live badly. That only, however, through the attainment of that which is true and necessary can this be done. Discrimination then gives man this picture, this picture of well-being, of rightness, of suitableness in all things, and reminds him that he is human, that of all creatures that he knows, he has been most internally gifted, gifted with understanding, with insight, with skill, with faculties and powers, with memory and imagination, with sense and intuition, that he may accomplish all these things. That these wonderful faculties should be bound utterly to a narrow circle of materialistic activities is naturally unreasonable. Man with a tenth of the faculties could maintain himself as efficiently as the ant whose culture and civilization, from a practical standpoint, is far greater than ours. But man has other purposes. He has other reasons for existence. And that he should have these powers and not recognize that they are invitations to growth seems incredible. That man should be able to look around him and see that he is greater than the animal and yet have no desire to excel that animal in essential matters is amazing and almost beyond conception. That we should see the great achievement of a few, that we should contemplate the wonderful attainments of those honored and venerated persons whom we regard as sanctified, and yet have no general impulse to emulate them, not to recognize that within ourselves is an open door leading to universal integration, not to see this in the presence of the power to see it means that we have long been chained and held to false opinions. The Pythagoreans 2,600 years ago sought to bring these facts to man. That man, being obviously the noblest creature that we can perceive, must also have the noblest destiny. And that this destiny cannot be fulfilled in war and pillage and competition and strife that these things do not lead to the end for which man is intended. They do not bring him into living communion with the gods. They do not restore him to his eternal estate. They do not liberate him from sin, ignorance, and fear. These things must be attained from within. A man endowed with the power to attain will attain if he makes the sincere and natural effort. But against this effort is the constant inertia, bounded by this eternal feeling that we can't do this and we can't do that. 
We simply lack this tremendous drive. Nature bestows impetus by giving us problems and showing us that we must either solve or be miserable. And in this emergency, with all our faculties and all our powers, man decides to be miserable. He still rejects solution, because this solution takes effort. And our civilization has gradually decreased our desire to use our resources for a purpose relating to our inner lives. Yet without this resource, so applied, our outer lives will never be solved. So the golden verses point to this future state in which man, joining with the gods in the infinite imperium, lives forever in beatitude, not necessarily actually meaning that he's going off into the sky and stay there, but meaning that he has found heaven within himself. That when he turns inward, he turns upon the countenance of the divine being. That when he is quiet, out of the hidden springs and fountains of his own soul flow waters of life instead of the polluted streams of his own perversions. That he can sit down and be at peace. That he can dream and hope. That his faith is stronger than any doubt. And that in all decision, he decides with the gods. And having made this decision, decision, finds that in all things the divine power is with him. This being with the gods, being true to the rule, having the courage and insight and love to dedicate our powers and skills to that which is the greater good, this decision, this insight, brings with it the consolation of spirit that surpasseth understanding. In that time and under those conditions, all these dark things will pass away. We shall no longer see through a glass darkly, but face to face. And we shall also discover that in this seeing face to face, life becomes very simple. The philosophy becomes very simple. And that out of all learning comes only the strength to do that which is simple. To do those things which are true and then to live quietly in the constant light of the presence of truth. To make this attainment is our natural end and our natural birthright. And into the golden verses, therefore, have been incorporated what seems to me to be the essence, the substance of the noblest thoughts of man. No great religion can deny these truths. It may attempt to develop them or specialize them, but still the principle remains that man, through the reformation and rededication of his life, through the offering of himself totally and without reservation to the service of truth and upon the altar of good, by these dedications and these consecrations, man justifies the good life, justifies the presence of the gods, and that which, earned, that which he earns he shall have, and that which he serves shall come to him, and that which is his duty shall be shown to him, and he shall dwell in peace with the gods through all eternity, and he shall have, as the ancient said, his birthright in everlastingness. And, uh, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Next week, we are going to uh, go in somewhat into the problem of Christian mysticism as it relates to man's instinctive search for reality. We're going to specialize and develop uh, somewhat the material of today, but there is now a new dimension added, and that is uh, the uh, a Christianized concept of the mystical experience as found in the writings of the early Christian fathers and uh, mystics of both the Catholic and Protestant denominations. And the subject will be The Dark Night of the Soul, taken from the title of a mystical book. But I think you will find it a rather worthwhile and stimulating line of thought. Now on Wednesday evening we're beginning a series of uh, courses at headquarters, I'm taking a series on astrotheology. 
or the effect of the belief in the heavens, the heavenly bodies, and the motions of stars upon the development of man's religious life. Now, a great many people today are worried about uh, Asiatic influenza. <laughs> How many people know the meaning of the word influenza? It means, literally, bad influence from the stars. That's how the word came into existence. So if you have influenza, you have a bad star somewhere. <laughs> or if you have a disaster, you have an unfavorable star. Dis and aster, an evil star. So these terms, which even in our language have come to us, may remind us that philosophy is deeply involved in these problems. I'd like to also call to your attention that we have articles on the Pythagorean system of philosophy in some of our publications. We have a section on it in our book, Journey in Truth, which deals heavily with the Greek classical wisdom. We also have an article on the Pythagorean system of numbers in our book, The Phoenix, and uh, also extensive article on Pythagoras in our Symbolical Philosophy book, the large volume that we uh, have had reprinted in photographic process. So therefore, you can have material about this school and its teaching from our publications. Let me also call attention to our Christmas booklets, which we hope you will find useful as Christmas cards. If you do some of your Christmas shopping with us, it will, we think, make more meaning in many instances to your gifts, also simplify your problems, and provide you with the consolation and understanding that sometimes ideas are better than things as gifts. And perhaps we need the gifts of ideas and ideals more than other things at this particular time. I'd like to also invite your consideration to the counseling service offered by the Society. A number of persons are taking advantage of it, not to get out of trouble, but to keep out of trouble. And if uh, anyone has any interest in that subject, there is a leaflet on the table explaining this service. If you are not on our mailing list, we'd be happy to have your names and addresses, and we hope you will visit our book table. We thank you for being with us, and hope to see you next week.